the way the Buddha describes our sufferings. It's like a feeding addiction. We feed on pleasures, whether they're physical pleasures or emotional pleasures. We cling to these things, and clinging itself is a kind of feeding. And so to treat the problem of suffering, we have to treat it the way we treat any other addiction. One is we have to realize that it's bad for us. That's what right view is all about. There are lots of things we feed on that we think are good. And the Buddha wants to point out that if you really look at the process of feeding very carefully, it involves a lot of stress and a lot of suffering. But it's possible to know that and still keep going back and going back and going back. This is why we need the other factors of the path. The right view does the work, but it needs the strengthening of everything else, particularly right effort right mindfulness, right concentration. When the Buddha defines right effort, it's a matter of desiring to give rise to what's skillful and to do away with what's not. You really have to want that. In other words, you could know that something is harmful, but you'll like it anyhow. And so you resist changing your habits. But if you look at it long enough and carefully enough, to the point where you have that desire, you really do want to get rid of it. Okay, that's a lot of the battle right there. So when you're sitting down to meditate, you find that your motivation is weak. You might take a little while to, to stop and remind yourself why meditation is a good thing, why your mind needs to be trained, and all of the suffering it can bring on to itself if it's not trained, the good things that happen when it is trained. And however you find that you're able to motivate yourself, okay, use that. That kind of desire is a good thing. As for right mindfulness, there's a lot of misunderstanding about mindfulness. A lot of people think it means just being aware of things or being non-reactive, being accepting of whatever comes up. The Buddha never defines it that way. For him, mindfulness is a fact, faculty of the memory. It's your ability to keep things in mind and apply them to what you're doing. We chanted just now that the three qualities there's mindfulness, alertness, and ardency. Alertness is your ability to see what you're doing here in the present moment and see the results that come from your actions. It means you have to be quick. There's a Thai phrase, Ru Tan, which means literally to know in time. In other words, your knowledge is equal to what's happening. You can see things happening as they're happening, and not you know five minutes later, ten minutes later. Because in order to deal with issues in your mind, you have to be there, right on top of things. Mindfulness then is what reminds you what should be done with this. If it's a skillful quality, how do you nurture it? How do you protect it? We've got our minds on the breath right now. How do you protect that? that awareness of the breath from all the other pushes and pulls in your mind and all the different committee members who tell you, now's a good time, you've got a whole hour it's free, you could think about whatever. How do you protect the mind? If you had some experience with meditating, okay, you can remember things you've been able to do in the past that help you to shed those thoughts. If you read something about meditation, okay, bring your memory to bear on what you're doing right now. That's mindfulness. Ardency is when you actually do the work. This is what brings right effort into the practice. You remind yourself of why you want to do the work and the good things that come from doing the work. This ability to keep yourself motivated is an essential part of the practice. Years back, I was going through some books of Ajahn Mahabhava's choosing talks to, to translate into English, and I kept noticing how many of the talks were 
basically talks of encouragement, pep talks. Challenge the monks, either criticizing them in such a way to make them develop some fighting spirit, or encouraging them that they had the ability to work at the practice. So sometimes you find that you have to give yourself a stick, and sometimes you give yourself a carrot. That's part of your ardency. And John Lee identifies this as the wisdom faculty in mindfulness practice. In other words, simply knowing things is not enough. The, the wise person actually takes good knowledge and puts it to use. But to do this requires strength, because often our feeding addictions, or whatever our addictions may be, they're worse when we're feeling weak and tired. That's when all our members of the committee come in and say, look, you're tired right now, you can't do the practice, but we've got this other pleasure for you here that's really quick and easy. This is why we need right concentration. This is for the strength, the strength in our ability to withstand those voices. Because we're working on a, a way of breathing that feels good. You're exploring your body from within, your immediate sense of the body as you feel it. And how well do you relate to that sense of the body? Are you in good terms with it? Are you in good terms with your neck? Are you in good terms with your head, your chest, all the different parts of the body? Try to be friends with them. And a lot of that means when you breathe in, how do you let the energy flow? Do you squeeze it in a direction that's painful or stressful or tight or tense? Try to picture the breath energy in different ways, ways that are bathing the whole body. It feels really good just being here with the breath coming in. and Think of every little cell in the body that needs a little breath energy. It, you provide it for all of them. They're all clamoring for energy. And here it is. Here it comes. So don't squeeze it off. Don't constrict it. The more you're able to be on good terms with your body, then even when the body is weak, you'll have a source of energy just simply by the way you breathe. And it helps to strengthen your realization that there are times, yes, when you're tired and you're feeling a little bit frazzled. But it doesn't mean you have to go back to your old feeding habits. You can stay right here. And it's okay. It may not be ideal, but it's okay. And you know that if you stay with the breath long enough, it will soothe the body or strengthen the body. But you've got to protect this. This is why mindfulness and concentration go together. The Buddha never talked about them as being two separate practices. This is one of the major misunderstandings that you often hear. For him, mindfulness, the topics of mindfulness or the practice of mindfulness is what you're doing when you're getting concentrated. It's simply that you get more and more deep into it, more established in it, more solid in it. At the same time, the qualities of alertness and ardency protect your concentration. We talked about knowing in time. This is what alertness has to do. And concentration can help with that in two senses. One is because the mind is getting more and more quiet, and you're right here. You can detect the little things going on in the mind much more easily. Secondly, you're going to need practice in not following your distractions. This is one of the, the most common problems everybody encounters. You sit down to meditate, and all of a sudden you find yourself someplace else, and you don't know how you got there. You're supposed to be focusing on your breath, but suddenly you find yourself mulling over something that happened three or four months ago. Well, you drop that, come back to the breath. And each time you come back, don't berate yourself, just reward yourself with a good breath so it, it feels good to come back. But be alert. The mind is going to go wander off again. You can't be the type of addict who says, okay, I've given up that bad habit and it's never going to happen again and I'm going to be solid and sure and never change 
you're just setting yourself up for a fall. You've got to realize, okay, the, there will be a tendency to go back to, if not that distraction, something else. So you have to be alert to seeing what are the warning signs that the mind is about to leave the breath. Part of it's with the breath, but another part of it is scouting around, looking for something else. Okay, can you, if you detect that happening, okay, then you can make the breath that much more gratifying, that much more enveloping. So the part that was looking for someplace else to go comes back and latches onto the breath again. The more quickly you can see the processes of how you get distracted, the more you'll be up on what's going on in the mind. The little choices that are being made by the lower members of the bureaucracy, the ones who tend to hide out work behind the scenes. The fact that you're quiet enables you to see their conversations more, more clearly. They do send emails to one another, but they're very quick, very short. But if you can see them in time, you can cut off the email say, nope, we're not going there. This is not the case when you're in right concentration that you just totally oblivious to things. You know, sounds are there. The question is whether you're going to go after them or not. When you're really solidly in the concentration, you're not really interested in things outside. But it's not the case that you're dead to everything. You're actually more quiet and quicker to see things. This is how concentration helps your discernment. It helps you to know in time to see in time, to be up on what's going on in the mind. And then you can use right view, that knowledge about what's a cause of stress and what's a cause or what's part of the path to the end of stress, to apply to whatever's coming up. Mindfulness reminds you. And right effort is what does the work. As the Buddha said, these three qualities tend to circle around one another. Right view, right mindfulness, right effort. But it's getting the mind into concentration that gives you the strength to carry the work through. In one of the Buddha's analogies, he compares concentration to food for soldiers in a fortress. The soldiers stand for right effort. Mindfulness stands for the gatekeeper of the fortress to make sure that enemy people don't get in. In other words, recognizes what's skillful and what's unskillful, keeps the unskillful things out, lets the skillful ones in. So mindfulness has to be choosy. It's not just accepting whatever happens. It just has to remember who's the enemy and who's the friend. And when you recognize a friend, how do you treat the friend? When you recognize the enemy, how do you treat the enemy? This is all mindfulness does, the work there. The weapons of the soldiers are the, the dharma that you've learned. And the wall of the fortress, which is covered with plaster in such a way that the enemy can't get any handholds or footholds on the plaster, that's your discernment. But for the soldiers to have the strength and the mindfulness to have the strength they need to do the work, they need the food of concentration. Because without that food, you can have the knowledge and you can have the memory, but you just can't do it. Your strength isn't up to it. So strengthen yourself with the concentration. This is a kind of feeding that is part of the path. Eventually you want to get the mind to a point where it doesn't need to feed anymore. But to get there, you've got to feed it well. As with any food addiction, it's not that you're going to starve yourself entirely. You simply learn how to, be, <coughs> how to eat in better ways. So look at your mind. What are the kinds of things that it tends to feed on? The things that are bad for it. 
and then learn how to feed it instead with the ability to get the mind concentrated to work with the breath energy so it really does feel nourishing and sustaining. It feels good being right here, breathing in, and all the parts of the body that need breath energy are getting the energy they need. And gradually they get more and more full of energy, they get more charged with the energy. You want it to be just right so that it's not getting frenetic. If it feels like it's too much energy welling up in the body, just think of it dispersing out. Out through the pores of the skin, out through the palms of your hands, soles of your feet, out through your eyes, whatever. But when the energy is just right, it gives you a lot of strength. When you have that strength, then the, the temptation to go back and feed in your old in your old unskillful ways just gets less and less and less, and you see more clearly what it was that led you to fall for that kind of feeding, and you got something better. There are better ways to feed the mind. You can feed it off generosity, you can feed it off virtue, you can feed it off concentration. All the good things that the Buddha set out in the path. This is why the path is an eightfold path. It requires all the factors. For it to do its work. <laughs>